قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم حسين مني وأنا من حسين قال رسول الله نور عيني حسين مني أنا من حسين حسين مني أنا من حسين ما شاء الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير ربي شرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وهل لقدة من لساني يفكه قبلي أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي جعل الحمد مفتاحا لذكره وسببا للمزيد من فضله ودليلا على آلائه وعظمته ثم الصلاة والسلام متحية والإكرام على النبي الأمي المكي المدني الهاشمي الذي سمي في السماوات بأحمد وفي الأرضين بأبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الأطيبين الأطهرين سيما أولهم أمير المؤمنين وآخرهم بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وأرواه العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ورحمة الله على محبيهم ومواليهم وشيعتهم مجمعين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم وغاسب حقوقهم ومنكر فضائلهم ملعنين أما بعد for the happiness of Hazrat Zahra'i Marzia for the enlightenment of the graves of your marhumin of the graves of the shahada, ulama and siddiqin for the safety of the followers of Ahl al-Bayt around the world and for the safety and the hastening of the reappearance of Hazrat Baqiyatillah al-A'zam Arwahun al-Fida Please recite a Husseini salawat All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The one who is Ahman and the one who is Ahim We have been looking at a discussion or at a hadith from the 8th Imam to his companion Rayyan ibn Shabib where the Imam explains the importance of the Aza of Sayyidu Shahada and he puts into perspective what those tears that are shed for Imam al Hussein mean we've looked at Bukha for Imam Hussein we've looked at tears that come down to the cheeks as an absolute forgiveness of one sin. Meeting with Allah, the Imam says, if you want to meet with Allah absolutely sinless, Fazul al Hussein, then go on the ziyarat of Imam Hussein. The next thing that Imam says to him says, Ya Shabib, O son of Shabib, if you want to receive the same amount of thawab as if you were also martyred by the side of Abu Abdullah, then every time you hear about Imam al Hussein, make sure that you say, Ya laytani kuntu ma'ahum fa'afuza fawzan adhima. Says, whenever you hear about Imam al Hussein, say these words, and you will be counted, you will receive the thawab as if you were there with the Imam by his side and had tasted shahadat by his side. The maqam of those that are in Karbala is something totally different to all the other shaykhs. This is why 
narration after narration when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling various prophets that reach the land of Karbala. He says, look, this is the place where the grandson of the prophet will be killed and with him will be killed men, the likes of which no one has seen before. These individuals who stand out from all of history because they were willing to put aside everything that they held dear and sacrifice themselves in the way of their Imam. Saying these lines of how I wish I was there with you is easy. But the reality is very difficult. We see within the history of Karbala, various individuals that came to the Imam. Imam invited them, but they didn't want to come. Umar ibn Sa'ad is one of those individuals. Umar ibn Sa'ad is visited twice. Once by Zuhair ibn Qayn and once by Sayyidu Shahada himself. When Imam alayhi salam visits him, he says to him, listen, Umar ibn Sa'ad, don't do this. Come join us. And I guarantee you the shifa'a of my grandfather on Yom al -Qiyamah. Now Umar ibn Sa'ad, by all intents and purposes, by the standards of the society of that time, was a religious person. He was not any military, he didn't have any sort of military prowess. He wasn't a massive general of some sort. The reason he was chosen was to confuse people. That on one side is Hussein, on the other side is Umar ibn Sa'ad. We know Umar ibn Sa'ad, he's a good man in their eyes. And so they were confused by that. And so Sayyid al-Shuhada goes to him, meet him says, listen, come join me. Says, Ibn Rasulullah, I've got family. I've got business in Kufa. Imam says, don't worry. We'll protect your family. Bani Hashim will protect them in Medina. We'll protect your family. We will protect your homes. We will give you homes in Medina. Don't do this. He says, yes, but Yabn Rasulillah, they've given me the governorship of Ray. The Imam looks at him and says, we can't give you the governorship of Ray. Umar ibn Sa'ad says, then I can't join you. So Imam says to him, Ya Umar ibn Sa'ad, no, that you shall never reach Ray. It is if I am seeing that you are lying on your bed and you are killed as you lie in your bed. Your head will be severed from your body and your head will be paraded through the streets and the children of Kufa shall stone your head. And that's exactly what happened to him. It is exactly what happened to him post Karbala. Many of these individuals had opportunities. They didn't have much life after Karbala. But look how Kareem Imam Hussein is. Munzir ibn Jarud, he died within a couple of months of the event of Karbala. If only he had joined Abu Abdullah. Instead of us now sending la'na upon him, he may have been those, one of those that we praised. But then there are those that would say the shahada, that left everything behind, had everything, left it all to come and be by the side of the Imam. We've been looking at the Husseini lifestyle, analyzing our life. Comparing it to the sifat, the characteristics that Sayyidu Shahada embodied. And comparing that whether or not my life 
that I am constantly reciting for in Ziyarat Ashura, Allahumma ja'al mahyaya mahya Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Oh Allah, make my life like the life of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Is my lifestyle truly like that? Or am I just claiming to love the Imam? Musa alayhi salam is walking through the street and he sees one of the army of Fir'aun holding on to one of his Shia. The Holy Quran says that it was the Shia of Musa. He's holding him by the neck and the, you know, fighting. And he calls out, he says, Musa, help me. So Musa alayhi salam goes over. He tries to break up the fight. It gets a bit rough. He punches the guy, kills him. One punch, not even a knockout, killed him. Single punch. Guy drops dead. Musa alayhi salam looks at that guy, his Shia, his Shia looks at him and they both say, just get out of here. So they both scarper. In the morning, Musa alayhi salam looks around. There's some calls, there's uh, some soldier of Fir'aun has been killed. But you know, nothing seems to be off key. So he comes out. He's walking through the marketplace and again, he sees the same guy fighting with another one of the Fir'aun Yun. Again, he's holding on to him and he's fighting. Some people just are always looking for a fight. They're always looking to argue with someone about something, anything. Even if they don't know anything about it. Anyway, this guy again, Musa alayhi salam looks at him, says, you are a troublemaker. What are you doing? He's like, Musa, help me, help me. He says, I helped you yesterday. Now you've got into another fight. So Musa alayhi salam says this and walks towards him. And he thinks that Musa alayhi salam is going to hit him now. So he goes, Musa, are you going to punch me and kill me like you killed the guy yesterday? Oh, everyone, he is the one that killed the man. Claim to be a Shia. Claim to be a Shia. But this is how he reacted in that situation. Am I like that? Because I'm also a Shia awaiting an Imam. When things get tough, Will I sell out to my own Imam? Because I heard there are good people. Ziyad, the father of Ibn Ziyad, was a governor of Amirul Mu'mineen to Basra. Imam Ali appointed him. And then sometimes you're like, why did Imam Ali appoint Munzad ibn Jarud? Why did he appoint uh, Ziyad? Because at that time they hadn't done anything wrong. You cannot be punished for a crime that you have yet to commit. So, what sort of Shia are we? Are we willing, or are we one of those that can't keep anything inside them? Remember yesterday the hadith I said of the fifth Imam that some are like glass; they can't keep any secrets. Some of our Shias they just blurb, uh, you know, blurt everything out. Certain things of Ahlul Bayt are not to be mentioned except amongst those that have Iman. Such as the Wilaya Taqwiniya of the Imams. A normal person can't understand that without having accepted faith, have that faith of the Imams in their hearts. But sometimes you want to come out, you want to start debating and calling this person a kafir and that person. Without actually having any strong Bunyad ourselves. So the next characteristic that I want to look at that we find in the life of Sayyidu Shuhada and throughout the lives of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, is a tadbir, organization. See, as a community, by all intents and purposes, we're very organized. But we're not looking at the community level, looking at the individual level. As an individual, 
How organized am I? This whole world is based on organization. There is a system in place for the whole world. And the sun runs on that term that is appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the moon as well. We have ordained stages for it. Allah in Surah Yasin is explaining all of this, this tadbir. Neither do we allow the sun to overtake the moon, nor can the night outstrip the day. There is tadbir. The world is based on organization. There is a system in place. Every atom from the smallest from the atomic level right the way to the largest mammal on the face of the earth everything has some sort of system some sort of organization and amongst all of this the most crucial part of this whole system the part around which everything circulates is the hujja of allah the hujja is that middle piece around which everything circulates if the hujja wasn't present, the heavens and the earth would fall in on themselves. You have to understand the maqam of the imam. Don't let anyone tell you that the imams were simply people that learnt from the Prophet and they just regurgitated. No, that person has no knowledge of kalam of Ahlul Bayt Understand the role of the hujja. The hujja is integral to the existence of every single thing in this known universe. Every single part of creation is subservient to the hujja. Because the hujjah dwells in the realm of wilaya. Everything is subservient. There's an earthquake in Medina. Hazrat Zahra sallallahu alayhi narrates this. Says an earthquake struck Medina. And all the inhabitants of Medina were afraid the earth wouldn't stop shaking. Earthquakes, aftershocks, everyone ran out from their homes and they came out into an open place. But when the earthquakes and the aftershocks would not stop, they came to the door of Amirul Mu'mineen. They knocked on the door of Ali. Ya Ali, what do we do? This is after the death of the Holy Prophet. Ya Ali, what do we do? Amirul Mu'mineen comes out and says, Are you afraid? They say, Yes, Ya Ali, the earth won't stop shaking. They say that Ali began to walk towards the people reciting something as he was walking towards them they said we listened carefully what is it that Ali is reciting and he's saying Ida and he's reciting it until he reaches the middle of the people everyone is standing around looking what is it that Ali will do they say Ali went into the middle of the people he sat down on the ground he slammed his hand on the ground he said oh earth Abu Turab is ordering you stop shaking the earth stopped shaking. Amirul Mu'mineen looked at all of the people that were standing there. All of them stunned. Ya Ali, what was this? He says, are you shocked at what I have done? They say, yes, Ya Ali. He says, haven't you read the Holy Quran? They said, what part? He says, Ida zulzilatil ardu zilzalaha. When that earthquake shall occur on yawmul qiyamah. Wa akhrajatil ardu athqalaha. And the earth will begin to reveal her secrets. Wa qaila al-insanu ma laha. And man shall speak with her. He says, By Allah, I Ali ibn Abi Talib am that man that on the day of judgment shall speak to the earth and she shall tell me all of her secrets. <laughs> the role of the Hujjah, every single atom in the earth is subservient to the hujja. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. That person hasn't studied aqaid enough. The hujja of Allah is the integral piece around which everything, everything circumambulates, all of existence. Because of the hujja, biyumnihi ruzq al wara. 
It is because of the hujjah, the earth receives its rizq. And it is because of the hujjah that the heavens and the earth continue to exist. You can never remove the hujjah from the earth because existence will cease to exist. So there is organization in this whole system. In this whole system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And Amir al Mu'mineen to Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein, salawatullah wa salamu In his will, he says to, uh, to them, Usi kuma, I advise the both of you, wa jami'a waladi, and all of my children, wa ahli, and my family. And those who shall read what I have to say towards two things. Bitaqwallah wa nadmi amrikum. Says towards the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and into towards organization to organize your affairs. Get your things, get your life in order. The Holy Prophet says, I don't fear for anything of this Ummah. I don't fear for the poverty that you will face. But I fear for your disorganization. He says, that's what I fear. When the Muslims lost the battle of Ahad, it was for what? Because of disorganization. Hubb al-Mal, they left their position to go and chase after the war booty because they thought that they were missing out. And as a result, the Muslims lost that battle. Imam Hussein alayhi salam once asks Amir al muminin says, Father, what was the life? You spent your whole life with the Holy Prophet. You know, Amir al muminin says that I followed the Holy Prophet around like a small baby camel follows its mother around. I learned from the Holy Prophet. And this is one of the things that ironically Yazid says. You know, sometimes Ahlul Bayt's fada'il are so great, even when the enemies try to suppress them, they become majboor, that they have to themselves say their, uh, their fada'il. When Imam al-Sajjad asks to go and recite on the, uh, the member, or he calls it a, a pile of sticks, they say, Yazid, let him go. What's he going to do? He says, no, you don't understand who this family is. These individuals have taken knowledge from Rasulullah zakkan zakka in the way that a bird feeds its child. They have received that ilm from Rasulullah. Not just memorized it. They received that ilm. That's why Amir al says, but zakkani Rasulullah zakkan zakka. Holy Prophet gave me that ilm in the same way that a bird passes food to its child in whole form. So Imam al Hussein asks Amir al Mu'minin, Ya Ali, Father, what was the life of the Holy Prophet like? Amir al Mu'minin says, The Holy Prophet of Islam would separate his life into two parts, three parts. Juz'un lillah, the first part was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second part was for his family. The second part of his day was for his family. And the third part of his day, لنفسه, for himself. And though that final part he split into two, one part of that was spent with the people, and then one part of it was spent solely with himself. Alone. It is so important on your spiritual journey, whatever, uh, whatever level you're at, whatever you're trying to achieve, everyone, whether you like it or not, whether you like it or not, you're on a journey to Allah. Yeah? It's a conveyor belt. Ya ayyuhal insan, inna ila rabbika 
Oh mankind, you are striving towards Allah. It's like a conveyor belt. It's going, it's going. Whether you like it or not, this path is going to Allah. You're free. You don't want to pray? Don't pray. You don't want to fast? Don't fast. You want to listen to music? Go ahead. You're on this conveyor belt. Do what you want. Look at haram, see haram, touch haram, do whatever. You're, but remember one thing. You are on this conveyor belt towards one place. إِنَّكَ كَادِحٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَادِحٌ and there will be a day when you will meet him and you will answer for every moment of your life you can choose to go against the grain the only way you see people trying to run back up escalators some people it's fruitless exercise you're going to that end whether you like it or not you're going there but there's an important part of your day that must be spent with yourself just contemplating tadabbur tafakkur think about your day away from everyone turn off your mobile phone god forbid turn off your mobile phone put it away Turn off the TV, move away from your family, everyone, just you, on your own. We don't get the time anymore. We don't get the time. We're always like, ah, I haven't got enough time. And it's interesting because time itself is a construct of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And time itself is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's something that Allah has given you. And Amir al-Mu'mineen says, the more you complain about not having enough time, Allah reduces your time even more. Every morning, ah, I haven't got enough time. Ah, I'm so rushed, not enough time. He says, okay, you're not, you're not accepting this blessing I've given you? Fine, I will, I will reduce your time. Quite literally, your day will pass so fast that you won't even realize, what have I done? He says, but you thank me for the time and utilize it, Allah gives you wasa in your time. He expands your day for you. It's the same 24 hours, but you'll get more done in that day. That's why you have ulama that, you know, from such a young age, by the time they're 20, 25, they've written 30, 40 books. Or that they're able to write a book in three months that takes 10 years to study. Because there is wusa in your time. So having that time when you're alone with yourself is important. It's not all about worship either. You'll be happy to know. It's, a, it's not all about worship. You know, some women and, uh, came to the Holy Prophet and began complaining. Ya Rasulullah, our husbands, they're, all they're doing is worshipping. They've left us, they've gone up into the caves and they're doing namaz and they're fasting and they're not wearing nice clothes. They're just, you know, dressed like tramps and uh, yeah, they're just up there. They're not coming back home. Or other individuals that weren't married, they said, no, we're not going to get married. We're just dedicating our life to Allah. The Holy Prophet became very angry. He called all of them. There was about 10 of them. The Holy Prophet says, listen, I am the Prophet of God. I eat simple foods, but I also eat nice foods. I wear nice clothes. I wear perfume. I do nikah. And this that famous uh, saying that we have, a nikah sunnati, but we recite usually at our nikahs, is part of this hadith. That the Holy Prophet is saying, look, I'm doing all of this stuff. What are you guys going up and living in, Mount, uh, in the caves for? Doing nothing else. Says, look, I live in this dunya. I take the pleasures of this dunya as well. There's nothing wrong with one pursuing their halal pleasure. We'll come to that afterwards. It's, it's not about enforcing all of this worship on yourself. You know, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam is doing tawaf of the Kaaba and Imam al-Baqir comes behind him. He's doing mustab tawaf, the heat of Arabia. Imam Baqir alayhi salam puts his hand. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam is young at the time. He says to him, listen, my son, don't put so much pressure on yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept small amounts of worship from you as well. 
It's not necessary that you go. That's, you know, one of our problems when, when it comes to developing ourselves spiritually, we go on ziyarat, we do hear a nice lecture, whatever. And when it changed my life, I go from zero to 100. From not doing anything, now ziyarat ashura, I want to do all the mustahab namazes, I want to do tasbih and this and this dhikr. And then mashallah, you know, you send out, does anyone have any amal? And mashallah, all the aunties send all the amal. Listen, you got to do this, you got to do this amal. Subhanallah, if we, if we wanted to go by the amount of our mal that are sent around on WhatsApp, Subhanallah, nobody would be working. <laughs> Do this our mal, this day and that day and well, no, in moderation. Imam al Baqir is saying to us, listen, there's two masoons speaking to each other. He's saying, look, in moderation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the small amount of worship as well. You know, people go for ziyarat and they're overstretching themselves, only sleeping an hour, and then they're getting really cranky and, oh, I don't know, going on the coat. What's the point? You're going for ibadat, right? What sort of ibadat? You know, Laylatul Qadr, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. I shouldn't say this is azad that we brought for the, the, the Maulana as well, bichara. You know, this qadha namaz that we have. Uh, 100 rakat qadha namaz, subhanallah. We spend our year wasting our time not praying our namaz on time, and then we waste Laylatul Qadr praying a namaz that is so fast that nobody knows what's going on. Up and down, up and down, heads hurting, nose hurting, knees hurting. Malana is reciting with such super speed that nobody knows what he's saying. That isn't Tibadat. Isn't she bad? That's a tick box exercise. I'm sitting there reciting Dua Kumail, Josh and Kabir, and it gets to about 30, and my knees start hurting. And then they put the slow reciter on. Game over, game over. Like, ah, we were doing so well. And they went and put the slow reciter on. It's not worship. It's not worship. Aside from your wajibat, don't force yourself to do the things that you're going to be distracted with. If you're picking up one of our teachers, you say, look, if you're reciting Quran or you're reciting Da'a Kumail or something, and you're, you know, you get to one page and then you start flicking forward and you're like, how need to go? Oh my God. It says, leave it. Your ibadat is enough for that. Because you concentrated. That ibadat is worth it. But the problem is that we have culturalized and checkboxed the religion so much that my Laylatul Qadr is not complete unless I've recited Surah Dukhan, Surah Tanqabut, I've done the hundred Rakat Namad, I've done this Tasmeet, this Tasmeet. By the end of it, I don't even know what I'm saying. Mulana is reciting and look. Looking at my phone. She bad it, right? She bad it. You're going to worship Allah. That isn't worship. That's a mockery. God, you know, Laylatul Qadr, listen, sort my problems out. Oh, wait. What's my friend just text me? Oh, there's another Ahmad. <laughs> so, you know, be, don't, you know, build yourself up slowly. Go, Ziyarat. Do it, go ziyarat, stay in the haram, as long as you're not distracted, focus, as long as you're focused. moment you start getting distracted, go take a walk, go get something to eat, go have a drink, whatever. Now come back and refocus if you want. As long as you're focused is fine, but we're all over the place. So sometimes a less is accepted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more so than all the other ibadat that a person does because there might just be that one tasbih that you recite that was truly focused on Allah and he says okay look I forgive all of your sins but in order to set that up an individual needs that organization within their life Imam Hussain alayhi salam Shabi Ashur look at how he sets everything up Part of the night is spent in Munajat with his Lord. Part of his night is spent with his family. Part of it is with his Ashab. And part of it is on tactics. 
that he was going with Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and going out and looking at the battlefield. Okay, we'll have this person on this side, we'll have this person on this side, we'll have this person in the middle, we will fight in this way. How else do you think 72 men lasted so long against an army of tens of thousands? It's through the tactics of Imam Hussein and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas that they were able to... Abbas, Nafadh al-Basira. We'll speak about it on the night of al-Abbas alayhi salam. The, the, that Abbas had deep insight, foresight. So the Imam spent the whole night. In a, and the first thing he does in Karbala, first thing, reaches the land of Karbala, who owns this? Let me buy it. No ghasbi. Let me buy this land. Comes under the ownership of Sayyidu Shahada, then he sets down his tents. There's a system, an organization. You, know, you make sure that there is tertib in your life. Amir al-Mu'mineen is siffin. He's fighting away and he's looking towards the sky. He says, Ya Ali, the battle's here. What are you looking up there for? He says, I'm looking for the time of, whether it's time of dhuhr or not. Ya Ali, in the heat of battle. He says, what are we doing this for? This is what we're doing it for. To protect the namaz, the time of namaz. That's what we're doing it for. Look at individuals in Karbala like Anas ibn Harith. Anas ibn Harith come to Karbala, he's over a hundred years old. And you want to see his level of organization, his level of preparation. Imam Hussein alayhi salam is born Zahir and he's still a very young child. The only Prophet holds him in front of the people. He says, this son of mine, Hussein, will be killed in the land called Karbala. And make sure if you are anywhere near him, you go and you help him. Anas ibn Harith lifts up, picks up sticks from Medina and goes, finds the land of Karbala. At that time, 50 something years earlier, finds the land of Karbala, sets up tent there. Fast forward, say the Shahada comes, comes to him, Ya Rasulullah, I heard your grandfather say, all those decades ago that you would come here. Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I have been waiting for you. I'm ready to go. He was so old on the day of Ashura that they say he tied a bandana on his eyebrows to lift them up so that he could go out and fight. A tadbir organization. Imam al-Kadhim salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi He says, separate your day into four parts. A part for God, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you're there and you're focusing on your prayers, you're focusing on your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, it's essential that you find that time. That this is for Allah. It doesn't have to be in segments. Let's say you break your day down and you say, okay, look, five hours for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, break down those waking hours that you have into four. It's like this four hours, and then I don't have to do it in one block. But I break it down, okay, an hour here, hour here, make sure that I do those three or four, five hours for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the, the dead. They look from the barzakh at us. And the riwayat say that they're constantly calling to a person. You know, why aren't you praying? Do, do more ibadah. Go and fight, fulfill your wajibat because we need it. We, when you come here, you're going to need it. You know, when a person enters the realm of the akhirah, it's a, it's a realm of destitution. That these individuals, that's why it's mustahab, they say, look, if you're eating something in the wilderness, you know, if you're going to, and you have some left over, throw it away for the animals to eat. You come back to the animals, the rights of the animals. It says, leave them some to eat. Obviously, if you're in the city, then make sure that you give it to someone that's poor, that needs that food. Don't just throw it away. You know, make sure you give it to someone. In the wilderness, throw it. And then we have riwayat that people that are in the barzakh, in that, in that realm, 
are so in such a state of destitution that they're saying, look, even that food that you're throwing in the wilderness or the piece of bread that you're throwing to the dog, throw it in our name. Throw it in our name. Give it in our name. We will receive the thawab for that. That's how desperate we are for the thawab. But me that is alive in this world, I'm ghafil from that life. I'm inattentive to that life. So I don't focus on my ibadat. I don't focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first part of the day, focus on God. The second part, the Imam says, focus on your work and your family. Focus on your work and family. What type of work? Whatever work. But the Imam says, look, when you go, try and put yourself under physical strain. Try and do something with your body. And we become so lazy. You're like, uh, I'll get, you know. I, don't, I can't even be bothered to. I was telling someone that um, somewhere in India, I won't mention where. I was, and they took me to a, a restaurant. And, uh, you know, the waiter came and they put the food on the table and stuff like that. And he put a bottle of water and he walked off. So the brother I was sitting with, you know, he looked up and he went, oh, excuse me. And now this guy's walked all the way to the other end of the restaurant. Call him there. Come here. Called him back. Called him back. To, says, open the bottle. Says, open the bottle. You forgot to open the bottle. But have I become that lazy that I can't be bothered to pick up my own plates from the table? The Imam salam said, look, go out and do physical work. The Holy Prophet and Amir al-Mu'mineen are sitting together. The Holy Prophet says, Ya Ali, I'm hungry. We've got nothing to eat. Imam Ali says, Ya Rasulullah, give me permission. I'll go out and try and find something. He goes, he starts walking around, no money. He sees a lady that's about to, he's trying to take water out from a well. She says, he says to her, can I help you draw this water from the well? She says, yes. So he helps her, he draws this water, he fills whatever bags of water she needs filled. And as a thank you, she gives him 16 dates. He comes back to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I earned this halal tayyib with my own hands. Imam al Baqir in his old age is there in the street. He's digging up a garden. Someone comes to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, this is below you, this is beneath you. Why don't you get someone else to come and do it? Imam says, by Allah, if I was to die in this state with this spade in my hand or this uh, uh, pickaxe in my hand and I'm digging this ground and if I was to die, I would die in the state of ibadat. I said, put yourself under physical strain. Men's are here now getting threading, getting the nails done. What happened to that marwa? That gallantry. Oh, no, no, I don't want to <laughs> go to the gym. I've got to make sure that I look slim. Just put your body under physical strain. There is nothing that can counter that. Yes, you've got a day job. I'm not telling you all to go and become farmers and leave your desk jobs. But try and find something that you're doing with your body. Don't rely on everyone help people. You are just hire someone to do that. Ah, oh, man, auntie, you lift your own bags. Because I swear to you, there will be a time where there will be no one to carry your burden. And you shall carry your own burden. And every man and woman and child shall carry their own burden. And that is the day of judgment. That scroll of deeds that every human being will come out of their grave with will be so heavy. They say were it to be placed on the mountains, it will turn them to dust. Don't be afraid of getting your hands dirty. Put your body under strain. Soldiers of the Imam, right? Or well, we're just hoping the Imam's gonna come and say something and <sighs> blow on us and that's it. <laughs> Strength of 50 men. Or well, he's gonna write us a taweez, I mean, mix it with water, drink it, pour it over our head, hop on one leg and ah, <laughs> subhanallah, super ashab. No, oh, put your body under strain. 
Don't be afraid. Especially the youth. Especially, obviously, the elders that have done their time. The youth. Talking specifically to the youth. I put yourself under strain. Go out. There's nothing wrong with it. The Imams alayhi salam did it. So the second thing, find time for your family and for work. Spend time with your wife. Ask how her day was. Spend time with your parents. Ask how when your parents are gone, it's at that time you realize how much and when you become a parent yourself, you realize how much you crave the attention of your children. Just because your parents may say one or two harsh things to you, that doesn't, that doesn't give you the right to totally ignore them and walk away. Because if you do that, damnation is towards hell. Ask those that don't have their parents anymore. 50, 60, 70, 80 years old and still when you say, mention their mother, tears come to their eyes. Ask them what a loss your parents are. Ask them how it feels that that Babur Rahma direct connection to Allah, when that closes, what happens? As long as your parents are alive, one of the famous ulama, he would say that I, whenever I would recite, all would be jam-packed. People out on the streets in Iran, the haram, everything full. Says I'd come and I'd be very happy. You know, so many people come to my majalis. Says one day my mother died and my crowds halved. And then they went less and less. And I realized the whole time, all this crowd that was coming to listen to me was nothing but the dua of my mother that was sitting at home on the musalla praying for me. And now that she was no longer there, the barakah of her dua no longer remained. So find time for your family and for work. The third thing, more important to the youth and the elders as well, find time for your friends. A part of your day for your friends. But what type of friend? The Imam says, what type of friend? He says, the friend that knows your problems and will tell you. Will tell you in a nice way. Listen, I don't think you should have uh, spoke like that. Maybe you shouldn't listen to music. All of that. He says, look for a friend. And a friend that is pure and sincere to you. Not one that wants something from you just because your daddy's got money. Or just because you've got a good job. Now they want to hang around with you. Before nobody wanted to know you. But now you've made yourself into a higher tax bracket. Now everybody wants to be your friend. He says, no, not that friend. He says, spend time with the friend that will tell you your fault. Al-mu'minu mirate al-mu'min. That the believer is the mirror of the believer. Everyone needs a friend that can give them a dusting down. And say, look, maybe you shouldn't have done this. Maybe you shouldn't have spoken like this. A friend that is pure and sincere. Fadl ibn Abbas is the cousin of the Holy Prophet. He was the Shabih. He looked like the Holy Prophet. He was known, very good looking. And wherever the Holy Prophet would go, he'd be with the Holy Prophet. He's actually one of the people, along with Amir al-Mu'mineen. Him and Amir al-Mu'mineen are the ones that carried the Prophet in. Uh, when they're nearing the Prophet's death for the Prophet to come and give his final sermon in Masjid al-Nabi. Fadl ibn Abbas is one day he'd ride with the Holy Prophet. So the Holy Prophet is riding the horse. Fadl ibn Abbas, is, his cousin, is behind him. And they're riding and a lady approaches the Holy Prophet. And she says, Ya Rasulullah, I have a question. Maybe her hijab was like, Masha Allah, you know, one of those ones. Uh, so the Holy Prophet starts answering. and Fadl ibn Abbas starts looking. The Holy Prophet grabs his face and look that way. So the Holy Prophet carries on talking to the Father Ibn Abbas again. The Holy Prophet says, I told you, turn your face away. So sometimes you need a friend like that, that can catch you at that point. Like the Holy Prophet called him, look, stop looking, stop being, you know, uh, <laughs> some people just have a problem, man. You know that problem, it doesn't go away. If you develop that problem in your youth of just staring, that doesn't go away. You can be old and decrepit and you'll still have that disease that you can't help yourself but stare at a woman. 
It's a disease with those lustful eyes. It's a problem. Having a good, good friend that will keep you on the path. Everybody needs that friend that is you're sincere. The young brother that was reciting at the start in the Holy Quran. You know, the ayah of the Quran, There will be certain people that will be dragged to hell. And as they've been thrown into hell, they'll be like, Oh man, I wish I hadn't taken that person to be my friend. Because of him today, I'm ending up in hell. When I'm selecting my friends, always look for someone that is better than you religiously. Always someone that you perceive to be better than you. If you don't pray Salatul Layl, you look at someone and think, you know what, this person probably prays Salatul Layl. Let me attach myself to them. I don't pray Quran very well, but this person recites Quran very well. This person is regular with their Salah. This person, I've never seen him lie or do ghibah. Make, make sure that you attach yourself to someone better than you. Don't always keep company with those that are below you, that are constantly blowing smoke up your backside. Because that is what will cause you to become arrogant. We surround ourselves with people that, oh, Sheikh, very good, Majlis. Oh, excellent. Oh, no, 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 you didn't do anything wrong. Oh, that was amazing. And all they're doing is destroying us spiritually. Surround yourself with people that are true to you, that are sincere, that will tell you. And then the last part, the Imam says, says and make sure that there is a time for your halal pleasure and he says and this is the most important because it will give strength to your to the rest of your day so make sure you find time to play your playstation make sure you find time for to go and play football go swimming go horse riding go make sure you find time for your halal pleasure for your halal leisure Islam encourages it. Go, travel, see things. Learn, gain ibrah, do whatever, just chill. It's okay to chill. You know, we somehow feel like really bad when we just, <laughs> well, I'm not doing anything here, I'm just relaxing and there's no problem with it. Go. The Imam says, go and do it. Meet with your good friends. Go, find time for yourself, just chill out, relax. Read a book, do something. Relax your mind. De-stress yourself. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as it's halal. So separate your day into that. Create an organization for yourself within. Become more organized. And create yourself a spiritual program. And from amongst them, you know, look at the friends that you have. Because good friends more than anything will aid you on this journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Find yourself friends like Habib ibn Madahir. Habib is that friend of Sayyidul Shahida that the Imam himself calls him Rajulun Faqih. Imagine, imagine. To the man that is a jurist. When Sayyid al-Shahada begins to be surrounded, more and more people are coming from Kufa on the plains of Karbala. Every day new contingents are arriving to join the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad. And Zainab al-Aqila comes to Imam. Says, oh my brother, there are so many people that are joining the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad. Oh Hussein, do we not have anyone that we can call? Aba Abdullah can only think of one person. Says Zainab, let me call Habib. Habib is part so close to Abi Abdullah, he owes his life to Imam al Hussein. But Habib is also part of the Shultat al Khamis of Amir al Mu'mineen, the five elite guards. He's very dear to Ahl al Bayt. His bravery was known. Imam writes to Habib, Min Hussein ibn Ali, 
إلى رجل فقيح from حسين بن علي to the man that is a jurist حبيب بن مظاهر حبيب I have been surrounded by the enemies حبيب if there is any way that you can make your way to Karbala then come Habib receives the letter, prepares himself. As he's leaving, he sees an old man standing by a stall. He looks at him and says, Muslim ibn Awsaja. He says, what are you doing? He says, Habib, I'm buying some henna for my beard. I've grown old. My hair has become white. I'm putting henna on my beard. Habib looks at him and says, Muslim, Come with me. Let me take you to a place that such a henna will be applied to your beard that it will never leave until the day of judgment. The son of Zahra is alone in Karbala. Muslim ibn Awsaja and Habib start making their way. Habib had already sent his slave to the outskirts of Kufa. And as Habib arrives, he finds his slave in conversation with the horse of Habib. Says, oh horse, oh steed of my master Habib, if Habib does not come, by Allah, I will ride you and I will go and aid the son of Zahra in Karbala. Habib hearing this, he says, you have that much love for Abi Abdullah. Go, I freed you. He says, Habib, where am I to go when the son of Zahra is alone in Karbala? Habib, take me with you. Habib, Muslim ibn Awsaja, his slave, they make their way towards Karbala. As they arrive in the land of Karbala, the news begins to pass that Habib ibn Mudahir has come. There is such a relief in the tents of Habib Abdullah when they hear that Habib has arrived. There is such a sense of elation. That when Habib comes and Imam Hussein runs to embrace him, Habib, you've come to our aid at this time. They say, as Habib and Imam are standing there, Fidda comes. Oh, Habib, the daughter of Zahra Zainab sends her salams to you. They say that Habib sat down on the ground and began crying. Says, what a day has befallen Ali Muhammad, that the daughter of Ali thinks me worthy of salam oh Habib if just the salam of Zainab was too much for you Habib what would you have done after Asra Ashur as the daughter of Ali stood pleading inside the tent why are you looting us as she ran from one burning tent to another burning tent Habib joins Abi Abdullah by the side of Imam, Shabir Ashur, Imam puts out the light, says, I've lifted my allegiance from all of you. Go, go. When he relights that light, they all stand there, but Habib is the first to speak. He says, Yabna Rasulillah, we will never leave you, even if they were to come and kill us and cut our bodies into pieces and then set fire to those pieces and scatter our ashes in the wind and they were to do this 70 times we will never leave you O oh, Abba Abdullah <laughs> Imam looks at them and says I none my father my grandfather my brother no one had ashab like I Hussein have the day of Ashura dawn the battle begins. In the first contingent that went out to fight, Muslim ibn Awsaja goes. And Muslim is made shaheed. Sayyidu Shuhada didn't go to the body of every shaheed. There's only a handful from amongst the Ashab and a handful from amongst Ahlul Bayt that Imam actually went to their bodies. Because at times it was impossible because they were fighting out in groups. But one of the people was Muslim ibn Awsaja. Both Habib and Muslim, both Habib and Imam ran to the body of Muslim. Habib is the first to sit down. He says to him, oh Muslim ibn Awsaja, do you not have any will, anything that you want me to fulfill for you in this short time that I have alive? Muslim ibn Awsaja says, yes, 
Yes, Habib, one thing, just one thing. Says, what is it? He takes the hand of Habib, he places it in the hand of Abi Abdullah. He says, Alayka bihadur rajul. Alayka bihadur rajul. Oh, Habib, as long as you are alive, make sure you don't leave Hussein alone. The time for Dhahar comes. Abu Abdullah prepares the army to pray Salatul Khawf. As the adhan is given, someone shouts out, Hussein, do you think that your namaz will be accepted? Why are you praying? Your namaz will never be accepted. It is at that point that Habib, infuriated, pulls out his sword. He turns towards Abu Abdullah. He says, Yabna Rasulillah, this salah, I will pray in heaven with your grandfather. He rides out and he begins to attack. He begins fighting as the salah is going on. Soon Habib is attacked from all four sides. He falls to the ground. As-salamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah. Oh Abu Abdullah accept the final salam of Habib. Imam rushes to the body of Habib ibn Mudahir. He stands by the body of Habib. Oh Habib, you were the one that would finish a whole Quran in a night. Oh Habib, my dear friend Habib. Abu Abdullah returns to the tents. The death of Habib was so important to the army of Umar ibn Sa'd that when they severed the head of Habib, they began arguing amongst themselves who is it that will carry the head of Habib? But because they could not decide and the argument would not stop, they eventually decided that they would place the head of Habib around the neck of a horse. When the head of Habib reached inside Kufa, the man that was holding the horse that had the neck of Habib on it, the head of Habib on it, he began walking. He said, I saw a young boy from the crowd running and looking towards this head. And he would run ahead again and look towards this head. And I looked at the boy and I said to him, boy, what is it that you want with this head? Why do you keep on looking at this head? Who are you? He says, my name is Qasim Hadar Asu Abi Habib. That is the head of my father Habib. My name is Qasim. Give me the head of my father. He refused to give the head to the boy. But I remember one other child in Karbala that asked for the head of her father. And instead of refusing to give it to her, they brought the head of her father on a tray. Sakina ran towards Abi Abdullah's head. She took the head of her father. Father, tell me who orphaned me at such a young age. Father, tell me who cut the veins of your neck. Father, how I wish that I was blind on this day, that I would not have seen your head in this state. The child lays down with the head of her father. The narration says she placed her lip on the lips of her father. Abata, father, father, they whipped us when we left Karbala. Father, every time we would cry for you, they would slap us. But father, no one was slapped more than our auntie Zainab because every time they wanted to slap us. She would stand in the way and say, don't slap the children of Abi Abdullah. Slap me instead. She sat there telling her father of everything that was to happen. Soon a voice came. Oh, ilayya, ilayya, fa'analaka bil intadhar. Oh, come to me, come to me, my child, for I've been waiting for you. The child falls silent. Imam al-Sajjad goes towards her finds the head on one side, the child lying on the other. He places his hand on her, calls out, Inna lillah wa inna ilayha rajoon. Oh, Auntie Zainab, my sister has left this world. Ala la'anatullah ala al-qawm al-zalimeen. Wa sayya'alamu al-ladheena dhalamu ayyumun qalbi yanqalibun. 
انا لله وانا اليه راجعون Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, for the sake of these tears, Ya Allah, forgive our sins. Ya Allah, forgive the sins of our parents. Ya Allah, those of our parents that are alive, give them long lives. Those of our parents that have left this world, give them a place next to Ali Muhammad in Jannah. Ya Allah, those who are ill, many people have contacted us from different parts of the world, Ya Allah with members of their family that are ill, they themselves that are ill, people from this community that have asked us specifically, Ya Allah, for the sake of these nights, for the sake of the daughter of Abi Abdullah, Ya Allah, give them all shifa. Ya Allah, those who are in debt, clear their debts. Those who are in education, make them successful. Ya Allah, keep our ulama and our maraja at the head of our institutions. Ya Allah, give us tawfiq to go on the ziyarat of Abi Abdullah. Ya Allah, hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time and allow us to be amongst his true mutadreen, his true waiters, Matameh Hussain.